as we mentioned a few minutes ago, Kyle Rittenhouse's fate is now in the hands of the jury. So what are the most critical elements jurors will be weighing in the deliberation room? Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Dave Bruno joins us live to break down the prosecution's case. There are no winners in this case, but putting Kyle Rittenhouse down for something he was privileged to do will serve no legitimate purpose. You lose the right to self-defense when you're the one who brought the gun. If it comes out at some time that the method used produces unreliable results, this is going to fall like a house of cards. A jury set to begin deliberations just hours from now as Kyle Rittenhouse could face life in prison for killing two men during the Kenosha riots last year. Yeah, here to discuss criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor and trial attorney Dave Bruno. Dave, what stood out to you yesterday during closing arguments? Both sides spoke for several hours. Oh, sure. I mean, what an emotional case. I mean, I didn't really follow it too much until the trial actually started. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I want to caution everybody. You really have to be in the courtroom to hear the evidence to come up with opinions on this case. And I did follow it closely. I mean, the, the fact is there's a lot of video evidence yeah. and there's not much dispute on fact because of the video evidence. You got the drone cameras, you got the cell phones, you got it all. But what's really the difference between the two sides is the interpretation on the law and what whether or not he was in fear of imminent death or serious bodily injury. And that's really what it comes down to. The prosecutor has the burden of proof, not only to prove the underlying crimes, but now the prosecutor has to prove, disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. You need 12 people unanimously to say that the prosecutor disproved the self-defense. Did, did they do that? I honestly do not believe he did. It's because of that evidence. I mean, victim number one, um, he was lunging at this individual. He was chasing the individual. It's very different than the first reporting on this. Very different than the prosecutor's opening statement. Incident number two, again, there's like a mob coming at this individual. One, he's getting hit with a skateboard. He's getting kicked to the face. People People are trying to get his gun. I mean, this is a 17 year old in a very, very difficult situation. And it's very different than we initially heard and it was reported. That's my takeaway from what I've been watching. You're right that the facts are more or less uncontroverted. This is all going to come down to the law and the law that everybody's focusing on, and rightly so, is the law of self defense. Right. We also heard a line in that opening montage of sound bites from the prosecutor where he said, and I quote, that you lose the right to self defense when you're the one who brought the gun. That is a factual incorrect statement of the law. Correct. That is not correct. Should the defense have objected to that being introduced during the prosecution's closing argument, or were they right to just let it lie and make the prosecution say another dumb thing on the record? Yeah, as in openings and closings, it's really not the time to continue to object, mm -hmm. object, object. It's really when the evidence comes in um, and the witnesses are on the stand. So tactically speaking, attorneys always have to make those types of decisions. This prosecutor has made multiple mistakes, right? We saw in the mistrial motion where he commented on the defendant's silence and commented on the defendant being in the court and looking at witnesses. The prosecutor, yes, that he made, makes mistakes, and that was certainly one of them, right? So he objected. I don't, I don't really cr criticize him for not objecting because in the end, the judge will give the law, right. they get the charge, mm -hmm. and the law says what it is that they have to follow. The judge just missed one count of illegal possession of a dangerous weapon by a person younger than 18. Yeah. Why did he do that? Sure. I, I think this is like the, this is the symbol. This is how this entire case went. The prosecutors alleged an, an illegal weapon and it went it, it, it was a complaint. It went through the case. Prosecutor didn't prove it. They had to prove that the barrel was under a certain length that they did not prove. So it was now, a technicality because he, he was 17 when he had the gun. Correct, so but I don't know if him. the barrel wasn't that length or they just forgot to do it. But it just goes to show you how this prosecution went. They failed to prove count number six. The jury didn't even get it because they didn't put evidence in to support a charge. If there is a conviction on any of the charges, and I'm asking you to speculate that there would be, right. have you seen enough to reverse yes. any of those convictions for prosecutorial error? Oh, it's coming back. If there's a guilt, if there's a guilty verdict, this is coming back on that mistrial motion. Mm -hmm. And what happened was the prosecutor 
prosecutor commented that the defendant was testifying, that he was testifying for the first time, and that he had never told anybody this story before. That is a constitutional violation. Yeah. Everybody has the right to remain silent. How many times have I been here talking about that's rule number one, criminal defense? I was saying it through the administration, impeachment, any investigation that I come here to talk about is rule number one, be quiet. Prosecutors can't comment on it, and that's what he did in front of this Being jury. Being a juror is such a big job. I mean, these closing arguments were hours long. Um, what do you think is going on in, in their minds right now, and when are they going to come to a decision? They have a lot to deal with today. They, yesterday was a long day for yeah. them. Um, they heard the charge. They heard the closing arguments, and now they come back today. And um, it's a self-defense case. I mean, literally, they have literally two issues to decide. Number one, um, did Rittenhouse, was he the initial aggressor? Because like Todd said, if he's the initial aggressor, he can't use self-defense. Right. And then is self-defense applicable? Mm -hmm. Did this man reasonably, and when I say reasonably, he had to believe that he was protecting himself, his his his, yeah. his life, and then what about objectively? But, but also, he was the one with the gun. So I think in some jurors' minds, they'll be thinking, okay, well, skateboard versus gun is that you know, is yeah. is that really worthy of self-defense to shoot somebody? Well, look, count six dismissed. It wasn't an illegal gun. Mm. The other people had guns. One of the victim in in the um, indictment had a gun. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's a very very fact specific analysis that they're going to have to go with, and they're going to have to decide what the facts are first, and then apply it to the law, and they have to be unanimous. And the key is, now the burden is the prosecutor had to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, and all 12 have to vote that way to convict. Yeah, my big worry, before we let you go, is on the jury front that they're going to feel pressure that... Absolutely. A not guilty verdict could lead to unrest or worse in the city of Kenosha. You certainly hope that we have not gotten to a point in our justice system where that is the case. Dave Bruno, New Jersey attorney and proud graduate of the Todd Pyro School of Talking with Your Hands. You get an A plus, sir. <laughs> well done. You've learned well. Thanks, Good Dave. to be that here. Very First time. I haven't yeah. been here since. I know. Pre We're happy to have you back. Thank um, God. Love it. Set We're getting back awesome, to normal. Guys. Thank Absolutely. You, sir. Carly built it herself. Yeah, I did with my own two hands. <laughs> uh, the time is now 23 minutes. After the